It is my very great pleasure now to introduce Professor Joanna Wardlaw. I would like to say she's a rock and stroke medicine and research, has received multiple awards for her work, and I believe that she's very well known by most of you. Joanna works as a professor of applied neuroimaging at the University of Edinburgh and is the foundation chair of the UK Dementia <coughs> Research Institute. And among many, many other areas, she has been instrumental in advancing our understanding of the causes of cerebral small vessel disease and development of novel treatments. Together with Anna Lindgren, who we, we will meet later, she has chaired the module working group for the guideline on small vessel disease and lacuna strokes, about, we, about which we will hear now. And Joanna, over to you. We are eager to hear more. Uh, thank you very much for the kind invitation. Um, I hope everyone can hear me okay. Uh, it's a great pleasure to present this part two of the ESO guideline on small vessel disease, which focuses on lacuna ischemic stroke on behalf of the um, guideline working group. These are our disclosures. Um, I would like to thank my co-chair, Arnie Lindgren, the people who led the individual PICO questions, the guideline members and fellows, all of whom have contributed massively to making this happen. Also, the guideline board representative, uh, Terry Quinn, uh, the methodologist and administrative support, and not least the reviewers and the editor of the uh, European Stroke Journal, um, who've all contributed to making this guideline, hopefully a very useful product in the end. Um, lacuna ischemic stroke is an important type of small vessel disease. It causes, it's the cause of a quarter of ischemic strokes. Uh, these are often mild. It's usually due to intrinsic cerebral small vessel disease, although it can be due to atherothrombosis or embolism, but it can be difficult to separate these out in the clinic. Um, in the acute phase, it can be difficult to differentiate lacuna ischemic stroke from other acute ischemic stroke subtypes. And some outcomes which are common amongst more severe strokes and amongst atherothromboembolic strokes, such as dependency, and early recurrence stroke are in general less frequent after lacuna ischemic stroke. However, cognitive impairment uh, affects a large proportion of patients, but it's often either not collected or not reported in stroke trials. Um, this guideline followed the ESO guideline approved grade process. Um, we focus on patients with suspected lacuna, clinically evident lacuna ischemic stroke. Um, we are not addressing covert small vessel disease, which was addressed in part one of the ESO guideline. We're not considering hemorrhagic types of small vessel disease, cognitive presentations, or other types of stroke that present and have a high small vessel disease burden. So specifically, lacuna ischemic stroke. We considered um, 10 PICO questions after a lot of discussion. Um, with these interventions grouped according to acute interventions, five of those and five interventions in secondary prevention. The comparator for all of these was either avoidance of that intervention or a less intensive version of it. And uh, these are the seven outcomes that we considered here. Um, I think it's fair to say that it's a difficult topic to address. We had to consider a large literature. And there were a few uh, truisms that became very obvious if they weren't obvious already. And that is that there have been vanishingly few trials specifically in lacuna ischemic stroke. And then very few trials provide data according to stroke subtype. And in fact, not that many trials actually even subtype stroke. And so what you end up with is that most lacuna stroke is mixed amongst other Look at other stroke subtypes, and it can be difficult to extract, and it's further made difficult by some heterogeneous terminology around lacuna ischemic stroke clinically evident. Um, so basically, we've tried to do as much as we possibly can with the data and perform several new meta-analyses and network meta-analyses. And we were also extremely careful to cross-reference against other ESO guidelines where relevant to avoid inconsistencies. Um, so I'll take you through um, the uh, sort of headline uh, information from this guideline. We don't have time to go into everything in detail. Um, and each of the topics, each PICO is laid out in a similar way. So you have the main question at the top, and I'm starting with uh, the acute thrombolysis treatment. So does thrombolytic treatment 
uh, compared to avoiding this intervention, reduce uh, a number of adverse outcomes. And the relatively large uh, uh, literature boiled down to data that were relevant from five trials of which three assessed a thrombolytic agent versus control. And that was over just over 500 patients. And you can see that meta-analysis here, including these trials. And the overall result in this uh, over 500 patients was not conventionally significant, although it was moving in the direction of favoring alteplase. There were very little evidence on other outcomes. And we obviously considered other trials with relevant data. And this led to the evidence-based recommendation that patients with suspected lacunar, acute lacunar ischemic stroke should be considered for treatment with standard dose 0.9 milligrams per kilogram alteplase according to current guidelines for the treatment of acute ischemic stroke. Uh, however, the data are limited. Uh, lacunar stroke is difficult to diagnose acutely and the power of this analysis is also limited, uh, which led us to these expert consensus statements after considerable discussion. Um, we agreed that patients with suspected acute lacunar ischemic stroke who did not have a contraindication to thrombolytic treatment according to current clinical guidelines for thrombolytic treatment um, there was no reason for not giving them thrombolytic treatment and they should be treated as quickly as possible with intravenous alteplase at the standard dose. And we did not find any evidence to support the use of other thrombolytic drugs at the moment or a different dose of alteplase. And this is consistent with the existing ESO guideline. Um, in terms of antiplatelet treatment, we looked both at uh, antiplatelet acute treatment and secondary prevention. And this summarizes both of those areas because the same overall search targeted both areas. And we found three trials relevant to acute treatment and 22 relevant to secondary prevention. Um, these three trials for acute treatment cast the Chinese acute stroke trial IST um, and TARDIS were all rather different and it wasn't possible to undertake a meta-analysis. And we also considered other trials which have looked at acute uh, uh, management. For secondary prevention, there was a larger number of trials testing a much wider range of antiplatelet agents in various different combinations and so forth. And to try and get as much out of this as possible, we've performed a number of meta-analyses uh, and network meta-analyses, but these are exploratory. Uh, so for acute antiplatelet treatment, our evidence-based recommendation was that effectively there is continued uncertainty about a specific combination of antiplatelet therapy over monotherapy. So we considered long and hard a number of trials which have tested dual versus single uh, in the acute phase. Um, unfortunately, the data for specifically for lacunar ischemic stroke is very limited. Um, so that was our conclusion. And the expert consensus statement was that we agreed that antiplatelet therapy should be started as soon as possible after stroke onset. And we accompany this by a uh, discussion, uh, trying to explain the thinking behind our conclusion that it may be reasonable to use dual antiplatelet therapy short term after lacunar ischemic stroke, according to recent trials. And this is entirely consistent with the ESO expedited guideline. Uh, for secondary prevention, as I said, there were, there were more data, and this is uh, one of the meta-analyses summarizing uh, antiplatelet therapy versus placebo. Um, most of the data relate to aspirin. Uh, we did not find evidence to indicate that other agents were superior to aspirin alone. And of course, uh, the SPS3 and MATCH trials showed long-term dual antiplatelet therapy uh, was um, did not improve outcomes and increase risk. Um, here is an example of one of the three network meta-analyses. This included over 20,000 patients. You can see the various individual antiplatelet agents here. Um, I would emphasize that this is exploratory. Many of these comparisons are indirect and they all reflect low certainty of evidence. Um, so this led to the evidence-based recommendation that um, for secondary prevention of long-term adverse outcomes, we recommend long-term single antiplatelet therapy with aspirin or clopidogrel from two to four weeks after stroke onset. 
Um, and our expert consensus statement uh, was that we recommend against the use of long-term dual or triple antiplatelet therapy, but focus on single antiplatelet therapy. Um, and we agreed that the current evidence was inadequate to recommend long-term use of psilocytazole in secondary prevention. Again, this is consistent with the current ESO guideline. Um, for antihypertensive treatment, we considered the use of antihypertensive treatment in the acute phase and also for secondary prevention. For the acute phase, there were five randomized trials and for secondary prevention, two randomized trials. You can see the acute trials listed here, totaling about three and a half thousand patients. Um, and these provided data on a number of relevant outcomes. And for secondary prevention, there were two trials, uh, both lowering blood pressure to target. Um, and they provided data on recurrent stroke as well as other outcomes. Um, top is the uh, meta-analysis for acute blood pressure lowering. And we've done a number of meta-analyses looking at trials, whether they included or excluded uh, patients who also received thrombolytic treatment, uh, timing, a you know, number of other um, secondary uh, sensitivity analyses. And it didn't matter how you do it. Um, there were, in terms of improvement in long-term functional outcome, acute blood pressure lowering provided a neutral result. Um, for secondary prevention, uh, blood pressure lowering to target uh, was trending in the direction of reducing recurrent stroke, but did not reach conventional significance despite including over 3,000 patients. Um, so for acute antihypertensive treatment, our evidence-based recommendation is that um, we um, suggest against the routine use of blood pressure lowering agents in the hyperacute phase, unless this is necessary for a specific comorbid condition. If patients are being considered for intravenous thrombolysis, then we suggest following the same guideline as in acute ischemic stroke at large. Um, and there is continued uncertainty over the benefits and risks of temporarily stopping versus continuing um, prior antihypertensive therapy. Our expert consensus statements were that there was insufficient evidence at present to provide a tight, precise time frame about acute blood pressure lowering, but we felt that um, avoiding for around 24 hours was probably reasonable. Um, and when patients are undergoing thrombolysis, we agreed that there was no particular advantage or otherwise of any particular antihypertensive medication. And hence the main priority was the blood pressure rather than which antihypertensive drug that you use. And most of us agreed um, that if patients were not being treated with thrombolysis and had particularly high blood pressure, then careful blood pressure reduction was reasonable and likely to be wise. And this is entirely consistent with the existing ESO guideline on blood pressure management. For secondary prevention using antihypertensive treatment, the evidence-based recommendation was that patients should receive antihypertensive treatment to prevent recurrent stroke and other adverse cardiac, cardiac vascular outcomes. Um, we agreed in our expert consensus statement that blood pressure should be appropriately monitored and well controlled, uh, but we couldn't advise any specific antihypertensive treatment. And most of us agreed that it was reasonable to try and aim for um, lower targets, but particularly trying to reduce blood pressure variability and avoiding drastic blood pressure um, reductions. Uh, lipid lowering in secondary prevention, there are two trials totaling almost two and a half thousand patients uh, shown here. They used a different uh, and, um, uh, uh, statin um, and had follow up for almost five years. And you can see from the meta-analysis that the trend is in direction of reducing recurrent stroke with statin, but it does not reach conventional significance. And this led to the evidence-based recommendation that there is continued uncertainty regarding the effect of lipid lowering specific to lacuna ischemic stroke. But we recognize that lipid lowering is effective in reducing clinically adverse outcomes in patients with undifferentiated ischemic stroke. And we agreed that patients with lacuna ischemic stroke should receive lipid lowering therapy, given that there is some evidence of benefit and no evidence of harm. Again, consistent with the existing ESO guideline. We examined extensively 
to try and find lifestyle interventions, uh, including things like dietary, smoking, weight reduction, exercise, etc. cognitive, as you can see here. Um, we found two randomized trials, one for exercise and one for vitamins. Um, both were neutral on their primary outcomes, and this led to the expert consensus statement that despite a lack of direct evidence, we agreed that it was advisable to promote healthy lifestyle modifications um, as recommended generally in secondary prevention for stroke and vascular cognitive impairment. And this should consider exercise as well as diet, weight, smoking, alcohol, um, and avoiding uh, excess sodium intake. And finally, we also examined a number of other agents which have been used um, in trials for lacunar ischemic stroke, and this is referred to as other treatment, both acute and secondary prevention. And this included things like phosphodiesterase inhibitors, uh, anti-inflammatory agents, nitric oxide donors, etc. And for acute treatment, we concluded that um, we should avoid GTN in the acute phase, that there was no uh, evidence to support the use of anticoagulant with hep heparin or low molecular heparinoid acutely, or a Chinese um, herbal medicine, and there was uncertainty for some other agents. And in secondary prevention, we were not able to recommend any current agents uh, specifically um, and to avoid anticoagulation unless the patient has atrial fibrillation, in which case patients should be managed according to the uh, atrial fibrillation guidelines. And finally, because um, progressive stroke is common amongst patients with lacunar ischemic stroke affecting between a quarter and a third of patients, depending on the definition. We also examined whether there was any evidence that any um, agents benefited uh, outcome in patients with progressive symptoms. And the short answer to that was no. And this is a really important area that needs future um, trials. So in conclusion, our summary is that we should treat patients with alteplase according to thrombolysis guidelines, start an antiplatelet as soon as possible, use a single antiplatelet long term, no evidence to support blood pressure reduction acutely, manage blood pressure in secondary prevention, but no evidence for particularly low targets or specific drugs, use lipid lowering despite limited data, lifestyle modifications are important, a number of treatments that should be avoided acutely, and patients who are in atrial fibrillation should receive anticoagulation according to um, existing guidelines and patients with progressive lacunar stroke, we need more trials. There are considerable limitations. Most of this is based on subgroup analyses and heterogeneous subtyping with limited power and incomplete range of outcomes. And it basically means there's a lack of conventionally reliable data um, to guide management. However, we've tried to get as much of this out as we possibly can. And we recommend a number of um, uh, ways in which um, research should um, move forward. So I'd just like to thank the module working group again, the guideline board, the uh, administrative and methodological support, and the reviewers and editors at the European Stroke Journal. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Joanna, for the great overview of the evidence and the uh, guideline uh, recommendations. Uh, kudos uh, to all the team.